Okay. No, it got switched around. Okay, so how much? I'll let you know as soon as we're ready. Okay. All right. We're going to be inserting your slide, Steve. Uh, he is kind of the director of the media here, so he's the guy that his team set all this stuff up. Sorry? I see mine over there on my table. Oh. Okay. We're good? Okay. Great. All right, everyone, uh, please get seated. We're going to begin our second panel discussion, Wrenching the Brain. The brains are survival machines, and so they do their best to map and deal with the world that they're exposed to. We talked a little bit about this in the first panel. Uh, you know, so some of the questions we want to explore in this panel uh, with a remarkable four panelists that we have, we now have our fourth panelist, you know, are what happens when a developing brain is traumatized emotionally, environmentally, physically, socially. I think we saw a touch of that in the video that we saw this morning. And what happens to its chemistry and its pathways? And as a result, the human being that owns that brain. You know, whenever childhood experience throws a wrench in the works. And what are the short and long-term effects of that damage? That's very important because they're both short-term and long-term effects. And so we have a, a terrific panel. Dr. Steve Sumi, Dr. Charles Nelson, Dr. Michael Georgiev, I, I blew it, there you go. And, uh, and Dr. Brock Morgan. So thank you all for being here, and uh, we're looking forward to another lively discussion. We got off to a, a good start, I think, the first time uh, with our first panel. So Chuck, I'm going to ask you to get us started. You know, ne neglect is a, a huge issue. And it's, it's an area that you're, you've really done some groundbreaking work in. Um, so I wondered if you could just start us off by explaining, you know, what, it might se seem simple, but what is neglect? And, and what's the effect that it has short and long term? So let me begin by uh, taking a step back to some of the things that were discussed this morning. So we established in the earlier panel that particularly after birth, experience plays a very critical role in shaping the architecture of the developing brain. And one way it does this is we overproduce synapses and then we cultivate those synapses based on experience. So it begs the question is, what is the brain expecting? And so one way that we conceptualize neglect is to think about what an expectable environment is. So we, as a species, given the limitation that we have a genome of only around 20,000 genes and 50 or so percent of those are expressed in the brain, is we can't build a brain that can do everything. Rather, we build a brain that makes certain assumptions and the assumptions are certain experiences will occur. Our, our species young can't take care of itself, so as a result, what happens is that we need to assume that someone's going to look, invest in us psychologically and physically, uh, pick us up when we are, we're upset, change our diaper, protect us from predators, and the like. Uh, but at a more simple level, the other assumptions the brain makes is that we'll have pattern light, we'll have someone talking to us, we'll have sound, we'll have someone touching us. So the way to think of neglect then is when these things that are essentially uh, have been conserved through evolution are lacking, the brain doesn't know what to do. And so there are two parts then to this. The first is, when the brain doesn't get the experiences it expects, what happens? And the embedded issue is some experiences are expected at certain points in development rather than at other points in development. And we think of this as critical periods. So the more hazardous issue then is, what if those experiences that are expected in a narrow window of time fail to materialize? So. One way to think of this is that the brain is searching for information, and if it doesn't get that information, it has 
the potential for catastrophic, uh, catastrophic outcome. And the way that would manifest itself is in the miswiring of the brain. So neglect, which is not only more common than maltreatment, but more insidious than maltreatment for the very simple reason that the brain doesn't know how to assemble itself if it doesn't get the right input. So the two themes I want to demonstrate in the slide I'm about to turn to reflect what happens when the brain is deprived of key experiences and what happens when it doesn't get those experiences during critical period. So you've all seen the images on the what looks to be on my left of kids growing up in institutions. Now the data I'm going to talk about for just a minute have to do with kids growing up in institutions, but I want to quickly point out there's nothing special about institutional care. Although there may be two to eight million children growing up in institutions, the reality is there are many more children around the world growing up in profound neglect. So what I'm going to talk about is not specific to institutionalization. It has to do with kids who don't get the experiences they expect. So. In a project that uh, Nathan Fox and Charlie Zane and I have been doing for now almost 15 years, we have been studying children abandoned to institutions in Romania. And it's a randomized control trial, so we have one group that is uh, uh, randomly assigned to a high quality foster care and one group that was randomly assigned to a care as usual. What you can see, this is my pointer, if you, if you watch where my finger's going, um, <laughs> on the top part where it says uh, early entry into foster care. So what you're looking at there are the effects of placement or removal from the institution and into foster care on IQ. And if you look at the bottom line, the gray line, you'll see that the kids who've never been in an institution have a perfectly normal IQ, around 100. If you look at the line above that, the blue line, those are children removed from the institution and put into foster care before the age of two, whereas the line above it are children placed after two. And you'll notice that the kids placed after two look identical to the kids who never left the institution, whereas the kids placed before two look vastly similar to the kids who were never in the institution. So part one then is at least for IQ, which is a proxy for brain development in some ways, we see an inflection point that occurs around 24 months of age. If you go to the bottom curve, now we're looking at brain activity. And if you look at the far left where it says institutionalized child, that's the amount of brain activity uh, that exists in a, children, in a child who's now spent much of their time in an institution. And these are false color maps, meaning that it, as you go from green to red, you're showing more and more brain activity. Uh, the, the, the nose is at one end and the back of the head and the left ear and the right ear. Just to orange you, you're looking down on the head. The point here is that if you look at the child in the institutional group, compared to the child placed in foster care after 24 months of age, those two plots are identical. If you look at the child on the far right who's never been in an institution compared to the child who was placed in foster care before two, those two plots are identical. And this is at the age of eight years. So this is showing us that the lack of profound, the lack of critical experiences during a sensitive point in development leads to very different patterns of brain development. That at the age of eight, the child who was removed and put in foster care before two has patterns of brain activity that are virtually identical to the child who was never in an institution. And conversely, the child who was placed after two shows activity that looks like kids who've never left the institution. The bottom line then is that we have sensitive periods in development. And I would like to, at this point, comment on something that was said earlier, uh, which was, it's never too late. Well, the reality is, it is sometimes too late. The amount of effort required, and Jack's second slide demonstrated this, the amount of effort required to get a brain back on track who sailed through a critical period without exposure to those essential experiences is enormous. And it's extremely unlikely that that brain will ever look as good as the brain that got what it expected at the right point in time. And on that note, I'll stop. Thanks. Okay, great. We'll, we'll have time to pursue that. Excellent. Okay. Um, Brock, I think, go to you second. Um, you know, you've done a lot of work and analysis on develop, how the developing brain reflects its advantages and disadvantages in, in the real world. Um, so maybe you can uh, tell us a little more. Oh, that's a, yeah, a stubborn. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Um, I'm going to start off just um, talking a little bit about the big picture, and then I'll come to the, the more specifics. Okay. Uh, for me, the significance of recent advances in developmental neuroscience lie in how the concept of environmental regulation has unified the biological and psychosocial domains. 
It's kind of like the neuroscientists have shouted over the wall, and it's a very high wall. Social scientists, are you still there? And they say, yeah. Guess what? You were right. <laughs> <laughs> environment matters. <laughs> Social scientists, oh, environment matters. We can see it in the brain. Social scientists think, hmm, in the brain, yuck. Mm. But a few of them actually climb over the wall to come and have a look. And so some core social science disciplines, um, sociology and economics, you know, basic social science disciplines, are radically and rapidly realigning themselves in, the, in line with the neuroscience. And I think the big picture is that what we are witnessing now is a scientific revolution of historic proportions. I think, you know, we can put it in the sequence, Copernicus, Newton, Darwin, Einstein, Michael Meany. <laughs> okay, really, this is massive because the whole view of what the human being is, is changing. And um, um, we now understand in how environment and genes interact. And uh, where's my slide? Okay, there you are. Okay, um, just to save a bit of time, because it's, um, I can skip through this, if I can just have the first animation. Okay, basically, what Meany and other people, and what's coming through from the neuroscience now is how the early psychosocial environment switches genes, not on or off altogether, but it's like opening a tap. Depending on the environment, the tap is open this much, or more or less than this much, and then, dare I say, it, there's a sensitive period and the tap gets stuck. And that's mm -hmm. the way it is, and then that gene expression gets woven into how the brain develops, and the mind develops, and behavior develops, and so on, to set the child on a, tr on a de developmental trajectory that is very difficult to, to reverse. Okay, so moving to the plot on the lower left of my slide, um, I want to show um, how the social environment influences things. On the, on the x-axis, you've got less poverty or more poverty. And uh, on the y-axis, you've got loss of developmental potential. And the line is, as you see it, 45 degrees. And you, there are different countries. So you've got Sweden in um, the bottom corner. You've got the USA on the line there, the UK above it, Brazil, and then my country, South Africa, right at the top. So what you see, the more poverty, the more loss of developmental potential. And this is basically the big picture that neuroscience is um, delivering to, to society. And what you see is what you get. There's no, you can't force that, that line down parallel with the, with, with the x-axis and have more poverty but no loss of development, developmental potential. Mm -hmm. And so, um, um, and yeah, because we can see it in the brain basically. Um, and trying to force that line down is essentially going against what the environment is regulating for. It's like throwing sand against the wind. The wind's just going to blow it back again. So we kind of have to think about being the wind, not the sand. And that's what I mean by um, environmental regulation, because, as has already been mentioned, adversity, poverty, um, creates um, um, developmental, developmental trajectories um, that are appropriate um, for those conditions, they're adaptive. And so you can't fix it. You can't fix stunting, you can't fix defensive hostility, you can't fix teenage pregnancies, you can't fix reduced maternal investment because that's what the environment is regulating for. So in 30 seconds, I see I've got left, I just want to talk about my own work and this is just an example of how um, one can change a neonatal environment. Uh, we've heard about neonates, um, premature, low birth with neonates struggling. My work involves leaving them with their mothers from birth. That's different to conventional kangaroo mother care, which happens after stabilization. We compare in incubator care to what we call skin-to-skin -skin contact, and the results are stunning. We think that alone can reduce, can achieve Millennium Development Goal 4. But you, because the thinking is not right, it's very difficult to get funding for that kind of work. And so the stress that we heard about, 
been acknowledged by a neonatologist earlier, we believe is caused by separation to a large extent. And that's an example of changing an environment to let the biology just do its job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, listen to you. we'll talk about it later. Well, okay, Michael, we, we've touched some, you know, we had some discussion in the, in the first panel about nutrition, but I know that this is, you know, one of several areas of real interest to you, and, and it's very important when it comes to understanding when we wrench the brain versus enriching the brain. So can you help us understand that a little better? Thank you. Um, right, and your nutrition is so interesting because we all do it. So we all assume we know something about it. And so I've decided no longer to call it nutrition, but metabolism. That's a scary word that sounds very scientific. So back off, no. Um, but if you think about it, it was mentioned earlier that, that 50 to 75% of the fetal energy consumption uh, the neonate at birth goes to that developing brain, and, and the brain actually, and the body actually has mechanisms by which it channels that up there for the survival of that human, that huge brain. We're like no other species like that, and that continues postnatally as, as well. Um, so we all know about nutrition. The, the brain doesn't grow without nutrition. Every nutrient is important for uh, for brain development, but there are some that probably have a greater influence than others do. And, and um, NICHD is very interested in defining what those are. You could probably all name them off the top of your head. Protein, certain kinds of fats, um, iron, zinc, copper, uh, choline potentially, folate. These are the ones that we really particularly need to concentrate on. And I'm a basic biologist. I work in animal models and cell culture. Animal models are pretty convincing that if not a critical period, at least a sensitive period exists for all of those that I just mentioned, driven largely, in fact, by the processes that are going on in the brain. So remember the brain, to talk about the brain, is it would be like talking about the thorax. There's lots of things in there, right, in the thorax. There's a heart, there's a lung, you know, you know they're connected. <laughs> Same thing with the brain. The brain is not a homogeneous organ. It has many different areas. They each have different developmental trajectories. So one asks the question, does a nutrient, pick, pick a nutrient, does that nutrient, in when it is deficited, have an impact on that developing brain? The answer is, it depends. And it depends on a couple of things. It, affects, it depends on the timing of it. So specifically, the brain area we're talking about and the behavior that emanates from that brain area um, has to have a requirement, a high requirement for that nutrient at the time that that deficit is likely to occur in your population. So again, using just iron deficiency as an example, you're not equally likely during your fetal and pediatric life to be iron deficient same, same rate at all times. There are periods when you're more likely to be iron deficient. The question we want to ask is, during those time periods, what's happening in the brain that is iron dependent and what are the, then the consequences of not having gotten it in there at that time. And you can do that for each nutrient. Now that's a very nuanced and, uh, and, and uh, approach, but it makes, it, it, it makes us understand a little bit better why broad nutritional policies occasionally work, occasionally don't work. It depends on what area of the brain you're affecting and then whether you are doing the proper testing to see the outcome effect. The other point I want to make, and, and this will keeps coming back, is again, because we all eat, we think of nutrient in terms of supply side. And I think it would be an, a, a, a mistake to think that all nutrient deficits will be cured by simply giving more nutrients. There will be an enormous investment of money and resources, and perhaps may, may not get you the complete effect that you want. Many nutrients, Iron, again, is a good example. Infected children do not absorb iron. You can give as much iron as you would like to those children. It is not likely to be absorbed and utilized. Proteins, we heard about fight or flight reactions. Those need fuel. That fuel is no longer available for building the body, weight gain, 
brain development, and so on. Growth is really icing on the cake, and it's icing on a cake that is in a physiologically neutral or calm situation. So we've heard uh, talk about stress. Stress and nutrients and stress and metabolism interact with each other and have profound effects on whether one actually accretes those nutrients and gets the brain development we're talking about. So sometimes, as I mentioned before, your best nutritional treatment isn't more nutrients, it's making the body more receptive to those nutritional treatments uh, to, build, to build your better brain. And finally, I want to say that nutrients are fuel. You need a motor as well. And when kids are sick and they are stressed, and there's plenty of basic biology evidence for this, they down-regulate growth factors. Growth factors are the transmission that puts that fuel into motion. So again, you can stand at the gas pump and pour as much gasoline as you want in your car, and you will wonder why that car is not going anyplace. You have to turn the engine on. So a little bit more nuanced approach in terms of factors that we can change to make our nutritional interventions more effective. Thank you. Well, Steve, um, I know that you've done uh, unbelievable work with primates, and, and I, I guess what we want to understand better is how the work that you've done translates into, uh, you know, how, how brain development works with children. Well, let's give it a try. My lab for many years has been focused on watching monkeys grow up, rhesus monkeys in particular. Uh, these are monkeys that um, are not our closest relatives, but they do share 95% of the same genes that we do. Like us, they can live just about anywhere, so they are a weed species, they're highly adaptive. They live in complex social groups, um, uh, who's uh, divided into families and uh, groups of families. And from my standpoint, one of the best reasons to study them is they grow up four times faster than we do. So we can see uh, long-term effects of early experience, uh, lifespan development, and how characteristics are translated from one generation to the next. And the picture in the middle is how monkeys, infants, typically grow up in the presence of their mother in tight contact. The, they develop strong social bonds, human-like attachments to their mothers. Uh, before they start uh, becoming more socialized, uh, they're usually weaned at about six or seven months of age. If their mothers are incompetent or maltreating, abusive or neglectful, or if they grow up in artificial environments without mothers, these monkeys inevitably grow up to be excessively fearful, the picture on the left, and they also become excessively and impulsively aggressive. They have biological differences that, are, that are, differentiate them from their mother-reared counterparts in terms of neuroendocrine function, higher levels of cortisol, in terms of neurotransmitter metabolism, lower levels of serotonin metabolism. Um, they have problems with their immune system. They have problems with metabolic, uh, measures of metabolic activity. They have high C-reactive protein levels, for example. And if you look at their brains, the top slide on the right, uh, but whether you're doing PET scans that look at brain chemistry or structural MRIs that look at how the brain is wired, they are significantly different from those, their brains are significantly different from those of their mother reared counterparts. When you look at their genes, um, you find also that these early experience differences show up in the genome. The slide at the very top is a slide looking at, at gene expression in leukocytes, but the picture in the brain is probably quite similar. Let me walk you through it very quickly. Every vertical bar is a gene. Every hor horizontal bar is a monkey. So it's mother-reared, 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 mother-reared going down, uh, peer-reared, 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 peer-reared. If you see red, that gene is overexpressed. If you see green, that gene is underexpressed. And what you see is virtually no overlap between the mother-reared uh, genome-wide expression patterns and those of their peers. If it's red in mother-reared monkeys, it's green in peer-reared monkeys. If it's green in mother-reared monkeys, it's red in peer-reared monkeys. So about one-fifth of the entire genome is affected by that early experience. We have started some interventions with these monkeys when they're a little bit older, at nine, 
eight and nine months of age. Our favorite inter intervention is what we call foster grandparenting, where we put in with our groups of monkeys an elderly postmenopausal female and an elderly male who happens to like kids. The female is there to provide comfort to those fearful monkeys that need it. The male is there to keep the peace. The, what the male you see there is named Doogie, <laughs> and nobody's going to give Doogie a hard time. So the aggression is much reduced, and when you look at what happens to the genes, which is the bottom slide, here not, we're not looking at gene expression, but we're looking at gene methylation. Um, at one month of age, more than 5,000 genes are differentially methylated in both males and females as a function of whether you grow up with your mother or whether you grow up in a neonatal nursery. The intervention starts at about seven months of age or eight months of age, and look at what happens by the time these monkeys are two years of age. There are still significant rearing condition effects in terms of methylation patterns, but instead of 5,000 genes being affected, for males it's only 2,500. It's been cut in half, and presumably with gain in behavioral and biological function associated with that. And look at the females. It's no longer 5,000, it's no longer 2,500, it's down to 750. Still a sizable number of genes, but it's one-sixth of what it was at, at um, one month of age. So these interventions, show that even at the level of gene expression and gene methylation, these patterns are reversible. It's not easy, as Chuck pointed out. Um, it takes special interventions. If you just left the monkeys alone, those 5,000 genes would stay different um, by the time these monkeys were adults. But with proper intervention, reversibility is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, uh, we covered a lot of territory in those four uh, sessions. I think the, the one question that comes to mind that, that all of this begs is, the, the big question is, if there's damage done, is there some way to compensate later? Um, and if, if we compensate, I mean, some, some, there seems to be some indication that we can, some indications that we can't. You know, how do we do it and what parts of the brain, can one part of the brain help to compensate for another part of the brain? Uh, Chuck, you want to? I was just reaching for my microphone. Okay, but I'll ask you to. So there's a, part of this question is, are, are there regional differences in the ability to recover from deprivation or uh, uh, adversity of some sort? And I think the answer to that is yes, in part because different parts of the brain have different timetables for development and different parts of the brain are differentially responsive to experience at different points in development. So it stands to reason that um, on the recovery side, we may be more or less successful in getting certain circuits or certain parts of the brain to respond to the intervention than other parts, um, depending on the principles I just laid out about timetables for development. I think that for our purposes, I think the areas of the brain we're most concerned with tend to be um, the cognitive and the social brain for the most part. Mm -hmm. I think that we know a lot about the immutability of sensory systems. If you were born deaf and your hearing is not restored until you're older, you're not going to have full auditory function. The same goes in the visual system. Although, as Jack said, our colleague Takao Hench has been working on ways of rescuing sensitive periods. But I think for our purposes, if you get things off the ground, nutritionally, sensory-wise, and, and the like, the bigger issue is, are these, uh, our children who are exposed to early adversity going to be contributing members to society? Will they be able to successfully negotiate the challenges of school, of an education, and then move into society and contribute to society in many ways? And I think the idea of children living up to their full potential is really an essential one. And I think those areas of the brain tend to be more in the front of the head, the prefrontal cortex, and possibly areas that live in the middle of the brain that deal with emotion and with memory and things like that. So I think what we need to move towards, and, and Michael hinted at that in his comments about nutrition, is smarter interventions that can selectively target specific areas or circuits of the brain, and then figure out ways to implement those interventions when, in, a, in a more mature brain, to figure out a way to say, okay, you pass through this critical period or sensitive period without certain experiences, but let's see if we can figure out a way to fool the brain into thinking you can now benefit from these experiences. And that's right where the science is right now, particularly in animal models, but the, the question is how can we launch this in the human? Right. 
Yeah, right. I agree completely. I think it dovetails with what Steve was talking about in terms of uh, methylation, reversibility of, uh, of gene, environment by gene effects. And I was talking with him afterwards. Uh, and Chuck is right. This is really right at the cusp of what is being done. Um, knowing the biology is important because sometimes it will give you a surprising answer. In the iron deficiency literature, um, it's been documented, especially in, in, in models, uh, because of a suspicion from the human data that once iron deficient as a child, you never completely recover. And uh, whether that's true or not, I think is still debatable, but it's concerning enough that a lot of people have devoted time in, in animal models to see what might be the case. And there are really two possibilities, and they're not mutually exclusive. One is, you missed a critical or a sensitive period for that nutrient, for that area of the brain, and you're just plain out of luck, sorry. Mm -hmm. And that's sad, but maybe that's what the truth is. Um, and the other is that you have dysregulated the brain, that you have patterned the genes in the brain, and, and I'll give an example of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that's a growth factor that's very important for synaptic plasticity, particularly in the hippocampus, that that gets suppressed. We now have evidence that that's suppressed through epigenetic ways. Does giving iron back change that expression? Well, not in an anemic model. What if you gave a nutrient that changed the epigenetics? That is, you gave a methyl donor or something like that, and we've done this. That actually does bring the BDNF levels back up. So if you didn't know the biology, you would have just thought, give iron, things will get better. Mm -hmm. That would probably be the wrong answer. You still want to give iron, believe right. me. But, yeah. but, but, but it's not going to fix the problem. Right, but it's not going to fix the problem. And Steve talking about the monkeys. Chris Coe has done some wonderful work in the maternal fetal dyad to show that psychological stress to a mother monkey in the, mid, in the third trimester makes the infant more likely to become iron deficient afterwards. And like the rest of us, he thought, well, I just must not be giving enough iron during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. We looked at how much iron they were giving. It was plenty. It turned out that stress was altering the transporters, the, the way that iron is transported to that fetus. So, yeah, I think you need to be smart about where you go after. The other point I want to make is that um, we think in neonatology, because we have all these preterm infants, is brain development or certain circuits dependent on post-conceptional age, or are they dependent on uh, postnatal age. Right? And it turns out certain areas of the brain develop very much based on clockwork. clockwork. Mm -hmm. And others are very much affected by experience. And some stuff that Chuck and I published showed that the cognitive system, the mostly hippocampal types of things, are quite experience dependent. That gives us hope that there is more plasticity in that system, that that system can actually recover. It gets more nuanced than that. Maybe the hippocampus recovers, but areas that that area was supposed to connect to during some important periods of development don't happen. You outgrow certain deficits, like your memory deficits from hippocampal damage, but you grow into frontal deficits because the connections weren't made right. So there are lots of layers to this when you ask the question, insult here, outcome over here. And it has very much to do with, the, with develop, connect, connectivity across development. Right, so, so that, has, that touches on the issue of something we were talking about before, which is the difference between critical periods and sensitive periods, uh, you know, with these doors open and close. Uh, Steve, do you have anything that you can say about yeah. that? A couple of points. Um, first of all, it's important, at least for our monkeys, to try to reverse these adverse effects of early experience because they get passed on to the next generation through epigenetic phenomena. So those mothers who maltreat their infants, and maybe 10% of mothers in the wild, monkey mothers in the wild, do neglect or abuse their offspring, they raise females who, in the next generation, neglect and abuse their own offspring. And so it's not a cognitive thing, it's, a, it's, it's an epigenetic it's, thing. It's probably a variety of things, epigenetics is part of it, but we know it's not purely genetic because of some elegant cross-fostering work done at the Yerkes Primate uh, Lab over the last decade or so. But if you can break that cycle, if you can reverse it in one generation, that means because monkey mothers tend to treat their offspring the way they were treated when they were growing up, 
if you can get a mother who uh, had problems of neglect and abuse but can reverse that, then she'll be a good mother to her own offspring and they'll be a good mother to their own offspring. And the problem, I won't say completely solved, but it certainly has been advanced. The reversals that we see happen not only at the level of gene expression and, and methylation, but also at the level of behavior. So the monkeys who are in this new environment are no longer as fearful as they were. They're no longer as aggressive as they were. We don't have the neuroimaging data yet, but I'll bet their brains are much more normal relative to what they would have been had there been no intervention. So from our standpoint, it's worth that extra time and effort to try to get them back on track and they're the next generation and the ones to follow on track as well. Because it has a domino effect. Yes. Right. The, also with respect to sensitive periods, we focus on what's going on early in life, but I believe, and I, there's evidence of some of my colleagues, that there are multiple sensitive periods throughout the lifespan. A very strong candidate is puberty, when everything is changing, both inside the organism and how that organism is being treated by others around it. Um, my guess is you'll get just as, almost as many genes switching their pattern as a consequence of experiences during puberty as those very early experiences. Okay. And who knows how long uh, that will go on. At later points in life, major life events uh, may open up windows and close others. Hmm. Um, onset of menopause may open up windows, uh, close others. So this work, especially at the, gen at the epigenetic level, is really in its infancy. And we're essentially learning more about how these things work and what pushes them uh, almost every day. Well, Chuck, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, just to, to sort of stitch together a couple of things that were said so far. Um, there are, unfortunately, a, an entire range of adversities we expose our children to. And we shouldn't expect, therefore, there, that a, a single intervention will remedy or redress all of the, all of the issues. So, you know, it's breathtaking in its awfulness of the kinds of things that children in this world are exposed to. But kids exposed to stressful experiences, maltreatment, deprivation, nutritional, I mean, the list goes on. We need to be mindful that if we're trying to uh, bring development back on even keel, different regions and different circuits will respond differently to these different types of adversity at different points in development. And we need to be smarter about the interventions we use. But the other thing about interventions from the scientist, scientist perspective is that an intervention is a powerful way to understand mechanism. So it's not only a way to save kids, but it's a way to shed light on why interventions work. Experiment. It's, an, it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. so, if we think of Head Start and Abbasidarian or early childhood interventions in a project that I'm doing in, in Pakistan, we don't know why those interventions might work. And I think if we understood that, we'd be smarter about developing better interventions. Do you think we're going to be able to get there? Yeah, as long as you don't ask me when. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when? I, I think no, Chuck's no. point is, is that those interventions work maybe they give you a 10 or 15 percent effort you effect size, you could get perhaps a bigger effect size if you knew what the biology was and targeted it more. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it's a, it's a matter of nuance. It's a matter of it getting is. more detail. And it's a matter of breaking down silos, as you mentioned before. If I'm all about, I don't know, iron, mm -hmm. but I don't ask the question, what is stress doing to the iron balance, or ability to accrete the iron, I'm always going to be locked into my, we'll just give them more iron. Right. right. So, and, and you frequently don't see those questions being asked in the large studies. It, it's hard to do. Sure, because you're not, right. you're not focused on that. Uh, Brock, I think. Yeah, I'd just like to do, perhaps put a slightly different perspective or kind of draw attention to something that I already said. I think this notion of fixing things is needs to be examined and interrogated. The terms like um, recovering developmental potential or brains being dysregulated, those are normative ideas. Those are ideas about what, how society seems to want brains to be, how society seems to want people to be able to compete in um, the marketplace and so on, and that people who've been born into adversity, into poverty, can be somehow fixed. Uh -huh. All right, whereas my point earlier was that that poverty environment 
is regulating them. It's not dysregulating them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Populations, from a biological point of view, living in poverty, they're growing. Mm -hmm. They're growing fast. Those brains are working Just perfectly. Fine. Right, right. They're not dysregulated. Right. It's, it's, the, the problem isn't that their brains aren't developing normally. The problem is that they're developing in a different kind of environment. So yeah. they map that environment. They're adapted, like um, Jack Shonkov said, diminished cortical or hippocampal function, more bottom-up function, more prone to defensive hostility, um, to um, what we call fast, hist fast life history strategies, grow up fast, mature young, have mm -hmm. lots of kids, put less investment into, um, your, into each kid. Those kind of things are being regulated for and they're not pathology. Right, I see what you mean. Um, so, um, so the, yeah, how, do you, how do you attack the problem? Well, like I said, and obviously it's not easy, but, um, and you know, um, this has also been said in, in, in the literature, unless you change the regulatory environment, um, other, right. other interventions are going to be of limited value. And I think, I think we're not experts in changing regulatory environments. We're not social scientists. Right, right. That's I was, a different issue, not I a scientist. I was down at NYU the other day talking to Larry Aber, a, a psychologist, who's doing interventions in 200 schools in Eastern DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and he's measuring things at the individual level, at the classroom level, and at the in, in, in between the schools level. Mm -hmm. And he's measuring genes. Mm -hmm. All those levels are being integrated. So there are, as I said, some social scientists who've climbed over the wall, and right. they should be here. Right, breaking down silos yeah. again. Yeah, trying to. Oh, one one of the things that I that I was really fascinated with in the discussion that we had, and that you in particular mentioned, Michael, was you know this kind of idea that it's a two-way street. You know that. That children can be stressed out, and you can give them all the iron in the world, you can give them all the protein in the world, whatever, and they're just not. And and, and that seems like it could it relate to some of the work you do, Steve. Uh, is that accurate? It's a theory. Um, <laughs> is it accurate? I don't know anything of it. It's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a theory. Is that true? There are good physio No, there are good physiologic models that show that um, poorly nourished children or poorly nourished organisms do not mount as good a stress response. So that's the direction from nutrition toward stress. Um, your white cells are involved and so on. So there's, there's good evidence that malnutrition blunts, nutri blunts important stress responses, right? You, I mean, you want to be able to respond to stressful right. situations. Right. Um, there is also evidence that stress, the, Co the Chris Coe study with the monkeys that I was talking about, some work from, from our lab, the preemies, that stress in turn alters what you do with your nutrients, whether you absorb them in the first place or not. So for example, if you are infected, you will not absorb iron because it's an inconvenient truth that bacteria love iron as well. So the body has actually, it's a very ancient mechanism, has developed a way to protect itself from having iron to be fed to the bacteria that is gonna threaten your life. On the other hand, your hippocampus is going, Hello, oh, I know. Hello, I'm here, right? Um, amino acids, certainly in the intensive care situation, is where this comes from, are diverted to feed glucose to that developing brain. It's got a high energy consumption. Right. Those amino acids aren't available anymore to structurally build things for you, growth. So I think there is a two way street um, between nutrition and stress. And I think that has implications then in terms of. Redu as Bruce McEwen would say, reducing toxic stress on the one hand, mm -hmm. and also the efficacy of environmental interventions. Are inter environmental interventions going to be more effective if you can also reduce stress? So they all triangulate. I think the question that came out at our last UNICEF meeting in February is, do these various just does the brain, if you will, or the various brain areas, are the sensitive periods to any of these environmental pieces, stress, nutrients, uh, social support, and so on, are those the same critical periods? Do they map onto each other, 
or are they different? Are there times when nutrition might be more effective? Is there time when social intervention might be more effective? And, you know, uh, so the timing may be very, very important as we plan policies going forward. How far away from understanding that do you think we are? I mean, that kind of comes back to the to what you said, Chuck, you know, don't ask me when, but I mean, do we feel like we're getting a handle? It seems like a, a rubric's cube, you know, where you've got to get all these pieces, all the timing together just right to, to figure it out. Jack might be the person to ask that question. Go ahead, Jack. I think the corollary question that uh, Mr. Lake asked was, um, can you overcome a deficit in one area, let's say environment right. or, or excessive stress, with uh, an intervention from another piece that you know is positive for brain development, like nutrition. Right, can you compensate somehow? Right, and I would have said as recently as three months ago, no, but I'm now actually more convinced, well, I'm, I'm, there, there's some interesting coming experiments around. coming around, again, having to do with epigenetic modification that, that suggests they, there may be a way to balance it. I wouldn't look at it as a panacea, but I would say that there are ways that you can modify. So it's a more matter of kind of rewiring as opposed to actually fixing the chemistry? I'm not sure at what level of neuroscience that would be happening. Chuck would probably have a little more insight into, into that. Um, we know, for example, with, again, using iron as just an example, iron af deficiency affects the neurochemistry, your dopamine, your reward system, your mood, right. your affect, and so on but it also affects the energy levels in the cells that it takes them to grow and differentiate. So again, it depends on which system and which timing. Well, uh, So I, well, I won't pretend to have a definitive answer, but it's a good opportunity to make a comment about expectations. And this is, I think, a great thing for UNICEF to embrace. So if you think about how this very complicated science is being used to develop uh, new treatments for disease, mm -hmm. um, people expect that, wow, this is really interesting. This will help us have a breakthrough to treat diabetes or heart disease. So the expectation is lots of companies will have unlimited resources and spend next 10, 20, 30 years testing lots of different things and hopefully somebody will come up with a breakthrough. Now we take something much more complicated like how you change the environments in which people are living and our expectation is we'll give a grant and in three years, people come up with an intervention and solve the problem. I mean, this is, this is really a, a, a very important opportunity to have, understand what the process is of turning basic science into a breakthrough intervention. It's not a kind of a one-shot thing. It's not a one grant, I'll give you three years, I'll give you five years. Um, this is a long, drawn-out process where we learn, and we learn from things that don't work as well as things that do work. And that's what we have to build in to this field. And in biomedical research, people live and breathe on figuring out why an experiment didn't work to design the next one. In our field, we hope the funder doesn't find out the experiment didn't work because then they won't give us <laughs> money to do the next thing. And that's why we don't make the progress that we need to make. This is as complicated as the science is, translating that into an intervention is infinitely more complicated, but doable. Doable if we have the same commitment to getting to the finish line. And I think the culture has to change about this yearning for a kind of simple, quick fix of a program that will make things better. We might have to have another conference about that one. Uh, yes. I mean, let's, if, you, if you don't object, well, we'll, wanna, uh, we'll open it up. Just respond to Jack's thing. You know, that said, I think that really puts it back in the ballpark of do it right the first time rather than looking for complex Fixes. cures to fix it to get you back onto trajectory. It's like preventative medicine versus acute care. You know, you right. can't set it up to succeed rather than set it up to fail. I expect a quick fix. Right, right. Right. My, comment, my comment in the question of the panel is a little linked to that and I really want to pick up back on what you said about the social change because um, we've heard wonderfully elegant um, uh, summaries of studies of interventions etc but can we ever go to scale with any of those narrow interventions and I'm really interested in this disconnect that I see between treatment fixing something up and then modifying the environment where social change, making small changes in environment can really affect huge populations. Can we ever go from an N of 100 to an N of 100,000 with you know, iron deficiency or fostering 
uh, children that have been reared in institutions, etc. So I'm really interested in asking the panel, how do we reconcile those two approaches? Uh, the very narrow, the, the evidence based, the sharp scientific focus of interventions to fix problems, and this broad social change that you just mentioned. Can we reconcile those? It's a sort of rhetorical question. How do we bring the best of those together so we move away from small ends towards a much broader population focus? I, th I think so, that's one of the things we really want to tackle. So I think you, we need to, there are more than one ways to make things better, shall we say. We focus a lot on repairing some damage that might have occurred earlier, be it, be it uh, some inherited damage or some acquired damage. But we can also uh, learn how to compensate for that problem and have alternative routes to get to the same desirable endpoint. And that might be more feasible in many cases, um, especially with respect to broader environments and broader, uh, larger populations. Okay. Uh, if I can respond oh, I'm to sorry, Brian. Brian. Yeah. I think we must also um, acknowledge that um, we have some examples of what I think the main significance of the neuroscience is, and that is um, its power to use a word that Jack uses a lot, to leverage changes in society. And we've already seen that um, mm -hmm. in policy changes in this country. And um, that one um, graph I had up, or not quite that one, but one that I sort of inspired me, came from a presidential White House um, address or briefing or something um, in 2012. So it's not only academia, it's not only sociology and economics that's changing, but the public discourse is changing. And that's why I think this is a revolution, because revolutions, scientific revolutions, are things that change the way people look at the world. Mm -hmm. And um, the notion yeah, of sure. toxic stress has gone a long way to change in the way, um, you know, the discourse and the practice. And so it's not, even an, it's not even a grant or an intervention, it's society changing. And that's the power of scientific revolutions. So. We have to find some way to take all that we've learned from the science and communicate it in a way that everybody yeah. else can get it to create we that change. A broader con conversation, a, a multidisciplinary, multi um, sectorial, I think the term is, mm -hmm. or cross sectional mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. type of. Um, this, yeah, this goes beyond science. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. really a. Yeah. And to, to, to kind of pick up on that, <coughs> there is a comfort in knowing at least for me and I think for many, that there is a plausible biology, that there is a science behind it. And I think that gives the policy people something right to, to step on, as opposed to, you know, it happens because the stars didn't align or something like that. There is, there is an actual plausible bio that biology is, behind it. That is why it's changed, because now, because of the iconic, now iconic meaning experiment, uh, we can point, we can say, you social scientists, get over here. We can see what's going on. Right. And right. people then are, take it on because it's, it's scientific. Yeah, right, right. Because it has some credibility. Uh, well, we, we, that said, I, 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 again, as a basic scientist, I want to echo what you said before, that we do hide behind it. So you, I can tell you anything you'd like about iron deficiency except what Zulfi knows, which is... So, so how do we take care of the problem here? Is it a problem and right. how do we take care of it at that social? It, it really is probably another conference because uh, that's a whole another social, social issue. Um, let's just take, wow, we've got multiple questions here and we're running out of time. Uh, do you mind if I take a question from the back of the room and then we'll take one other one and then we should probably wrap up because we're behind schedule and we can you know, address the question when you're up. Good morning. My name is Liva Sala. I work for the disability section in UNICEF. I had a question in my mind that I wanted to ask to the first panel, but then I saw in Dr. Nelson's profile that there was mention of expertise in autism, so I postponed the question, but there's a, re there's a relationship with the discussion on environment too. At the World Awareness Day on autism last month, the Centers for Disease Control gave new figures of one child in 68 in the US 
is identified with autism. Two years ago, it was one in 88. 12 years ago, it was one in 150. Besides the fact that we have more improved and more sensitive screening tools, how can you explain this trend? Oh, who wants to? No, she said chuck. Chuck. Yeah, she said right. chuck. Would... <laughs> <laughs> really we, we could, perhaps we could talk about this later. But <laughs> so um, you t really touched on two issues. One is how do we account for the increased prevalence? Earlier in your question, you asked about the social environment. So let's come back to that one. I think most people think the increased prevalence, a lot of it is attributed to earlier identification, um, um, more liberal identification, which is code sometimes for people who don't know what they're doing making the diagnosis. <laughs> um, I think all the pediatricians here would recognize that one. But when, the, when all is said and done, I think many people do believe that there is a legitimate bump in the prevalence figures, even when you partial out changes in diagnostic criteria and early identification, which begs the question of what is responsible for that. Now, I know Steve and I have had, uh, in different contexts, discussions about the genetics and the epigenetics of autism. The reality is 15 or maybe 20 percent of cases of autism can be accounted for by genetics, but those are usually single gene disorders like Fragile X and Rett syndrome and the like. The, where we haven't looked is in the environment. Now, to go back to your earlier question, in Mike Rutter's sample of Romanian adoptees into the UK, he reports 10% had what he called quasi-autism. In our work in Romania, 5% have autism. I almost never talk about that because of the risk that people will confuse two things, which is that it's maternal deprivation that's causing autism. And that's really not the point. The point is that there are many ways to catch autism. And there are many ways to derail a brain that would lead down a phenotype that we call autism. But a lot of this is an instrument or a measurement issue. Um, I don't think for a moment that kids with fragile X uh, or tuberous sclerosis who have autism have the same autism that the kids in my study grew up in institutions have. This is a problem, but it's not specific to autism. This is, not, this is also true for many other disorders. The point then, to broaden it out to the people not interested in autism, is there are many ways to derail brain development. And they're environmental, and sometimes they're genetic. And our job is to understand how that happens. I think it was, Frank was saying that he wouldn't, knowing what he knows now, he wouldn't have, have kids now. It is frightening the number... <laughs> I, we'll talk later. But the, <laughs> um, I think the storyline, though, is that it is frightening the number of ways you can derail brain development, but for the most part, it works okay. You know, that's what's amazing. We're looking at the glass half empty, but the glass half full is the fact is most kids are okay. But, and the things when, when they're not okay, a lot of those things are preventable. And that's the point of probably much of this meeting. Right. We're just screwing our kids up by doing all these wrong things to them early on. I guess screw up is really not a scientific term, but. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right, we are uh, pushing our schedule, and so I'm, I'm going to ask everyone to take a break now and uh, get a bite to eat. We'll be back here uh, at lunch. Try to be back on time so I can try to keep things moving along. Thank you.